working on it. All right. Should be live now, good to go. Just trying to make sure on my second screen here that that's what I'm seeing. And as usual, we had some technical difficulties, but we're off and going. My YouTube page still says we're not live yet, so that's why there's a few few seconds of me running on there before there's anything going on. But happy to be uh, happy to be doing another Tuesday live clinic. Um, something that I was I was pretty go Leafs says uh, Coach Scott. I appreciate it. Um, we're uh, we're getting now into the time of year where hopefully we're all going to be you know playing football sooner rather than later, and we've had a year um now to to really look at you know the game and, and learn more about the game and I think one of the things that I'm trying to be cognizant of you know as a coach myself is how to how do I take maybe the things that I've learned over over quarantine or the things that are you know new to the game um and and put them into my playbook and how do I make that as efficient you know for my athletes to learn as, as I can um, and appreciate everybody who's liked the video on here already. We're actually only 50 subscribers away from a thousand, um, or I think 48 now. So if anyone's watching who hasn't subscribed, please do. It also is a huge help to us. If you like the video, the more people that like it, um, the, uh, the more people that will find it, that YouTube will spit it out to and send to. So, uh, if you could like the video and uh, hit the bell for notifications, it'll let you know when we're online, I uh, had a little hiccup there with the first, with the first live attempt, but we're up and running now. So. Um, I'm just going to fire off a quick uh, message here to make sure people know we're good to go and we're online. But I think one of the challenging things that, that everyone's going to face at any level, whether it's, you know, U sport level down to, to Wee, is how do we build a playbook that our players can understand? And how do we build a playbook that we're then able to, you know, functionally use um, and teach from? And, and I think that one of the biggest challenges is now football, whether it's offensive or defense, you need more answers than you ever have. Um, and I think that that, especially as an offensive coach, you know, you think about all the new different things you see on defense and, and vice versa, the new, whether it's RPO or, or whatever it is. Um, and you want to have all these answers, but you can only use the answers you can teach and you can only use the, you know, a certain number of answers, right? We're all limited by our practice time, our access to video, uh, you know, whether the age or experience level of our players. Um, so I think it's a topic that's worth talking about and it's something that we're going to keep kind of revisiting. Um, tonight, I kind of on defense wanted to talk about, you know, packaging blitzes. I think that's one rabbit hole you can go down and and wind up spending a lot of time on. Um, and and I've definitely been guilty of it in the past and not doing a good enough job of keeping consistencies between, you know, different blitzes and, and, and blitz packages. Um, so we'll talk about that and blitz pass. And then and then we'll talk offensively about, you know, pairing things using using inside zone as an example, but really you basically just using tags with any run play. Um, and how you can build off that and create what looks like a variety of plays to the off or to the defense, uh, you know, which is really one play for the offensive line up front. And then kind of the quarterback equivalent, uh, keeping your pass game simple uh, so that you're able to, uh, your quarterback's able to read it out and, and be effective without being too simple, without being predictable. So being able to have some variation in there uh, without, uh, without being predictable. So that's what, that's what we're going to look at today. I'm going to get my screen shared here. And we'll get rolling with it. As always, I've got my eye on the chat. Uh, so please throw your questions up there. Um, if, if there's anything that as we come up, even if it's like an adjacent side topic, I'm happy to, I'm happy to get into it. Um, but we'll, we'll work off of any of the questions that come up in the chat. Um, and, and I'll make sure to get those answered before we're done tonight. So um, really for me, I, I think this is an area of huge learning myself that I've definitely done a better job in the last year, uh, learning to um, take everything that I want, everything that I feel like I might need and kind of build it into packages so that it's not as much for the players to learn. Uh, one good quote I saw recently, I think it was Dan Casey, was talking about having your coach's playbook be as big as possible and your player's playbook be as small as possible. And I think that that's an interesting way to, to frame it in your mind as a coach, if you want to keep something in your back pocket um, you know, it's one thing to have it in your kind of quote unquote coach's playbook. Um, but it's another thing to, you know, to expect and be able to have your players know it and, and understand it. So, um, that was kind of the onus for, I saw that quote and I liked it. And that was kind of the onus for this presentation tonight. Um, in terms of blitz packages, 
And I think that this is where you can go down a huge rabbit hole and, and we'll keep it, um, you know, kind of, kind of within just one pressure and kind of show you the, the theme or what I'm looking for when I'm putting together a blitz package. So obviously everyone has, um, you know, their basic, their basic pressures. Um, and, and the one I wanted to start with, and I, and I thought, you know, it would be to show it out of the simplest front, we just do it out of an over front. So what I want to talk about tonight in the front, and we're going to do it through the lens of pressures is front multiplicity and, and coverage consistency. And I think that that's something I've heard a lot of really smart coaches talk about recently. Um, heard a coach, uh, from, uh, uh, the, the Bobcat Cincinnati, I was playing on, but a great year defensively. Um, talk about how they always want to keep coverages consistent, but they're going to be multiple every week in the front. I've heard really good, uh, whether it's U sport or, or CFL coaches say the same thing. And I think in the Canadian game with the extra receiver and the stress that's put in the secondary with motion, waggle at the line of scrimmage, just the space they have to cover. Um, you know, I think we always talk about keeping it simple for the offensive line or simple for the quarterback. Um, and I think you, on defense, you really want to keep it simple for the defensive backs and then and try and cut the front loose and have different options or variations within the front. So we're just going to look out of a basic over front as kind of our starting point. Um, and and the pressure, the first pressure we're going to look at is just like a will fire or will plug. So everyone's got it in their playbook. You're rushing your front four um, out of the even spacing or, or over front. OK, and you're bringing the will. And the first coverage we'll look at is just like a basic uh, cover one. So there's a lot of different ways you could play this, but we'll just look and say, okay, we're playing as the first down deal. We're going to play cover one. I'll get into some ways that you can, um, you know, make that a little more uh, varied in a sec, but we're going to play cover one free safety, you know, is helping in the seams. So uh, depending on the level you want to play at, you could play your, your inside defenders uh, with outside leverage, funnel them back to the safety. Uh, and then we'll say for now, for simplicity, that the mic has the backs. So we're not peeling anybody out of the backfield. So we're playing cover one. You could play it with match principles um, if you wanted to. Um, uh, but we're looking at base five man pressure. So everyone has this in their playbook. Right. And there's not very much um, there's not very much disguise to this. So if you're bringing this type of pressure, you know, typically this is like a first down deal. Very basic. If the offense is doing basic stuff, it can help you. Um, but where people I think tend to get into trouble and where I've gotten in trouble in the past is saying, okay, we're going to call this blitz one thing. And then we're going to call another blitz, another thing. And we're going to, okay, but in this blitz, we're going to change the coverage this way and not having a firm set of rules. So that's what we're going to talk about here is just kind of building a firm set of rules. So we're going to look at this. Um, we're just, uh, we're just going to call this uh, Waldo for now. Cause we're bringing the well. OK, so what I what I've kind of shifted to in my defensive philosophy is I want to call a pressure path and then change the front to whatever I want or need it to be. But we'll keep the pressure path the same. And what I mean by that is basically you're going to shuffle the deck with the front and the presentation, but everyone's going to have the same gaps. So when we when we call Waldo, if we've called over Waldo. All right, we know that we're lining up and over and we're going to get to our Waldo gap. So the mic isn't blitzing, okay? Um, and they're going to be responsible for uh, the, the A gap to their side, okay? The D linemen just have their gaps in the over front. The over front's a good place to teach this from if you're a four down team, okay? And then your will's going to insert into the B gap. Very, very simple. Now, I think what the biggest thing that I've learned recently is now trying to take that and run that same pressure, but with different presentations in the front. So really, really simply, one of the easiest ways would just be to shift the front. So now we could line up in say under, right? Under, and if, but if we call Waldo, we know we're getting back to those base gaps. So now we're gonna spike Okay, back to our base gaps. And now the will is going to end up back in that weak B gap. Okay. Again, nothing crazy, but it just creates and keep and keep it the same blitz. Don't go, don't call this something else. Right. So you're going to change the name in the front, but Waldo tells the, the front and the linebackers, hey, we're bringing a five man pressure. Our coverage rules are going to stay the same in our base cover one. We'll talk about that in a sec, but we're going to be able to get to different, different paths or start in different locations based on the front. So that's kind of, you know, the first really basic one that I would look at. 
would be just shifting the front, but you can get creative from there. So again, let's just say we're, we're, we're starting in our base. Again, if that over front is kind of our home base, which it is for a lot of teams, we can now get into a number of, of presentations. So we could shift this all the way uh, to say a front, uh, let's bring the end down. Okay, if you wanted to get into like a, like a real over front where, the, where you're gonna put the nose head up. Okay, if you're anticipating that this is the slide side. So for example, if, if you get into this look, if you're gonna get, you know, potentially you might get big on big, but if you know that they're gonna four man slide this to this side, right? You can line up in the over, get them to slide that way. And now I got my two one-on-ones on the back side. Again, if I've called Waldo, the end knows, hey, I'm in, in the C gap and the will knows, hey, I got to finish in the B gap. Okay. And they're able to do that again, just from different front presentations. So this one, I really like if, if you know what you're going to get in protection. So for example, if you know, hey, if, if I put the nose, if I put the nose on the center, they're going to form four man slide. Then I really like having the will outside and you're able to run that kind of up and under path. It's tough for the back to have to track it and find it. Um, and, and ultimately you're getting to that same spot. You know, you can continue to, to find different front variations. And this is where I think the game's gotten really creative recently. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff you can find online, but again, keeping that, keeping that path the same. So another good one would be to walk the mic up. Right, this could be in, in more of a, a, a pass, passing situation. You could walk the mic up and now get the Will out of the box. Will looks like, okay, he's he's out of the threat. Now I know we're going to get our running back on him if they go 5-0 protection, uh, if they go 5-for-5 five five or big on big. And now we can have the mic, you know, drop out and play the back. And again, because we're running Waldo, the defensive line knows we're getting all the way to our spots for Waldo. So Waldo's always going to finish with that will in the week B, nose in the strong A, tackle in the sorry, nose in the weak A, tackle in the uh, in the strong B. Mike knows he's got the strong A gap here uh, in in his run fit. Ends are on the ends are playing the edges. So that's just a really simple way, you know, looking at a pressure that everybody runs. And then if you want to take it to another level, now you can start to add tags off that call. So you can start to, whether it's twists um, or whether it's, uh, or whether it's a 30 personnel package, which we'll get into in a sec, you know, you can still, we're just talking about one pressure and we've shown about four or five different variations. So let's take a look here. If you wanted to get into, you know, some kind of stunt game, you know, again, leaving it where we had it, you could have the will walk up on the guard. Mike is playing at depth. Again, another 5-0 look. This is great if you know you're going to get, uh, if you know you're going to get big on big. Lost my guard there. If you know you're going to get big on big, Right, put the will there, and then you can run a three-man game. Again, still all called Waldo. You're just changing the name in the front. And I think that this is where you can really, especially on second down, this is where you can really create uh, some challenges for the offense because you can you can really set this to their protections. So if you're getting a team where you know, hey, if we line up in 5-0, they're gonna they're gonna go big on big. Well, now you can, you know, you can get them into those 5-0 looks and bring the will from outside the box. So you can get them in this 5-0 look. And now, okay, the running back's got the mic. You know, now you know you're going to be able to run these man pick stunts with the front three. And again, these these four, these three are all getting back to the same gap. You're just changing the presentation. Um, and then you can even take that a whole bridge farther if now you want to get into playing a 30 front. And again, I think this is where a lot of the, you know, I've coached mostly, you know, four down defense in the last, couple of years um, and I'm definitely trending more towards being a 30 base team but even if you're a four down team there's lots of great reasons to be a four down team even if you're a four down team on second down you may want to get into you know a three down uh, alignment so you might 
you might change this up and say, hey, this rush is now going to be a linebacker. Let's walk them off the ball. Maybe now we're playing some kind of 30 stack. Right, if you want to give yourself options. But if we call Waldo, we know at the end of the day, the Will's going to end up in the blitz in the weak B gap, and we're going to balance out the front into an over. So again, simple way to change the presentation uh, for the offense, but ultimately you're running the same thing with the same coverage behind it, uh, which makes a big difference for, for keeping things simple for your guys on the back end. Another, another simple way of doing that or of adding a level of complexity is, is to get into just tagging stunts with it as well. So a nested stunt or an embedded stunt into the pressure. So again, let's say we're in our base over front. All right, we want to run our Waldo stunt, but there, you know, the, the offense has seen it a few times. We want to add a wrinkle. We want to make it a little more challenging, you know, to pick up. Okay, well, let's let's take our ends can still rush to contain. All right, now we can switch the interior gaps of the nose and the tackle. So you could penetrate here, right, and fold back over top, especially if you're getting uh, if you're getting the slide uh, going opposite. Okay, so if they're trying to slide this guard to block the will, say the running backs on the other side, right now you're able to get that looper from the man side, which is challenging for the offense to deal with. Um, and you're able to, you know, again, run the same pressure with the embedded stunt. Another one of my favorites with that would be run this the same way. You know, you could run the exact same thing uh, with the stunt on the other side. Okay, one of my favorites would be to go wide mug. Again, another 5-0 look. Walk down over the center. It's your big on big protection. And again, we're still just running Waldo. So the nose is gonna crash. We're gonna insert the wheel into that B gap. And then you can get your twist game on the opposite side. So how you call that in, you know, you could you could tag that whatever your TR stun or your RT stun or your N, NT stun is, you can just tag that on the end of Waldo. And again, you're changing the presentation all out of the same blitz. So you could have you know 15, 20 different pressures all out of this, all out of the same look, and just base them on the week, whether it's the run scheme you're getting. Uh, whether it's the type of pressure that affects the quarterback you're going against more, whether it's, you know, an offensive lineman that you want to attack, whether it's they're predictable in protection and you want to, you know, stunt to the side of the back um, or you want to force the offensive line to fan because they struggle to fan in, in fan protection, whatever it is, you can just get a number of different looks out of that. Um, and that's just with a basic will plug, nothing, nothing crazy there. Um, the other thing I like about kind of these base cover one pressures is you can build in more into your cover one, depending on, you know, the, the complexity of the defense you're looking to play. Like I said, you can play more of a match variation where, uh, you know, the, to each side, they're going to drop an under route, um, and leave the mic and peel the back. Okay. Or you can play straight cover one. You can either even bring six. Um, and one of the tags I've seen really effective with this is, um, to just call plus, so if, if we were to call Waldo plus, that means we're also going to bring the mic. So for example, let's say we wanted to get, um, let's say we wanted to get that basic Waldo plus. Out of our over front. If we were to just bring that straight, that would, you know, that would just be, there's your Waldo. There's your plus. And then we got to tag, how are we going to cover the back? Well, we'd have to peel. Okay. And I, and the way I have it set up in, in, in our defense, the defense that I'm running right now is if we call plus it's automatically peel. So all of our peel, it's all one and the same. So all of our peels are out of a plus call. So we don't need two terms for it, but it, you could do it both ways. Um, so that just means that whatever side the back releases to the edge rusher and the pressure has the back out of the backfield. So if the back were to release, 
the edge player to that side would have to peel out of the pressure and take the back again, staying in cover one. So we've now shown, you know, a variety of different presentations and a variety of different potential pressures all while still in cover one. So then now you're bringing that plus again, you get all the same variations, right? You can get in your wide mug, um, you know, whatever it is you want to do. Right, you could get in a double jet, same thing. You're gonna end up in the same spots. So now you can you know, continue to be creative, but you're gonna end up fitting the same location in the pressure. So first off, just taking a simple pressure and saying, okay, we're gonna run this out of a variety of fronts and they don't need to be fronts that you carry every week, right? Uh, you, you can change this up as you go um and and build different fronts for different opponents um it's just a really effective way uh, of going about it and, and building different packages the second path i want to talk about uh is kind of traditional ncaa path so really really common uh in in th for three down fronts as well it's probably like a base pressure out of three down fronts but we'll look at it for it again so that's a good cover one example if you want to play zone Probably my favorite way to simply do that right now and again, create a ton of variability. And there's lots of good ways you could play this out of cover three. I got my corners on the wrong side here. Lots of ways you could do this uh, and, and, and play cover three as well. I'll draw it up with quarters, just if you are playing a little more of a, of a developed passing game. So similar idea in that we're gonna run the same pressure. I'll start it out of the over. We're gonna run the same pressure uh, and get to the same spots, just dress it up with a variety of different formations. So if we want to run, uh, let's move this over here. I'm just going to call it smack for uh, Sam and Mike. So if we want to run uh, another five man pressure, and this is great if you got a defensive end that you can drop, um, if we want to run another five man pressure, but we want to bring some, you know, some overload pressure, pressure from out of the box, but we still want to play cover, cover three or cover four. Again, you want to find a way uh, to keep, to keep it consistent in terms of what coverage you're going to play on the back end. So for me, you know, if we're going to get into corner quarters, the corner is going to have to cut and carry. So he's got to play vertical of one week boundary half. will play the, uh, the boundary hash marks, field hash marks, Field numbers, field flat. Okay, and now we're going to get into, you know, dropping out and getting into kind of underneath zone. So the the end away from the blitz is going to drop out. So they, they still have the C gap, but they're going to drop out. Okay, the mic has to drop uh, to, the, uh, to the middle of the field. Okay, and then, sorry, the will. And then that gets you your three underneath players. Um, so your will's got a long way to go here. They've got to end up being kind of your wall player. I said middle of the field, but they got to end up kind of being your wall player to the field. So this is kind of like your fire zone coverage. If you wanted to play this out of cover three, you could and just not carry the corner and that gets you a harder flat player on the other side. But now we're going to long stick both defensive defensive tackles. rip the end down inside and we're going to try and get two off the back hip in pressure so i've seen this play too where they'll peel the back out so if the back were to release you can peel the the sam uh as a cover player but again you're playing 500 or you're playing um f another five man pressure playing zone behind it and then i'm going to keep these these zone these lands landmarks all the same and now you can just continue to change out um, what your actual front is. So same path. So no matter what front we started at, if we end up in this path, we're going to call it smack. Same thing you could do from the boundary with the will in the weak half and, and you know, call it whatever you want. Um, but when we're running smack, every time we finish, we're going to stay in the same alignment. So we're going to finish with the end all the way down in the A gap, the tackle in the opposite A. The nose is going to work to contain from the B. So they're going to work through the B gap and then to that open edge. If they get a tackle who blocks down, they can read it and, and continue to work all the way to the edge. All right, we're going to get in this same position with this path. So 
So just a couple, because you've already seen how it works, um, you know, with, with the Waldo stunt. But just a couple formations I really like to run this out of. Obviously, you can run out of an under. Makes it a little more, uh, a little simpler um, for, the, for the tackles to work to the opposite side. I've seen two, um, and I wouldn't necessarily do it this way unless you had a really athletic three tech, but I've seen a few people run this with this type of stunt, really trying to get the line moving and then uh, bringing the mic off it. Again, getting to the same spot. Um, but where this gets really, where you can get really creative with this is just by changing the front. So let's say, again, we want to get into uh, like a really good one here would be to get into the under, bring the end down inside, jet your mic backer, and now get your will in the middle of the field. So again, you're probably gonna get a 5-0 protection, um, or at least a, a lot of places you're gonna get a 5-0 protection, meaning now as they drop out here, going five for five, this tackle is going to get wasted as the, as the quick drops out. Your nose can work to contain. As your nose widens, it's, it should create this angle for the, for the tackle. And then this R is really close to it. And then here with the mic, the mic can read this offensive tackle. So he's going to go inside. And now you get your Sam off the edge. You should be able to get your one-on-one -on -one with the back there with, with the 5-0 protection. So we get one-on-one -on -one with the back. We should get one-on-ones across the board. This tackle might be able to help late on the nose. Okay, and then we're still being able to play zone and, and bring a five five-man pressure, uh, which I really like. Same thing if you get if you want to get into the 30. So if you wanted to, you know, same deal, trying to trying to get more speed on the field, maybe you take your rush end out and they're going to end up playing linebacker. You know, you can get into a lot of good looks, whether it's, whether it's um, you know, setting the, just having that R be off the line of scrimmage, right? Where now they can walk down and really get tight to kind of create that condensed edge. Um, whether you want to jet, you know, have that will backer up in the five down to really, you know, really try and waste two potential players and now bring uh, the pressure off the edge. Lots of good looks you can create, but again, keeping that, that the same allows you to bring all these variety of pressures and, and keep everything the same on the back end. You're not now oh, bringing the different linebacker and, and now the coverage changes out. Um, you're keeping the coverage the same and consistent. Uh, and just change in the front. Um, and obviously you could get into stemming with that as well and, and all the challenges that that would create. Um, so those are kind of the two pressure paths I just wanna talk about um, in, in terms of trying to keep things simple in the front, um, going to, or keep things simple in the back end and, and creating multiplicity in the front. Um, I think you can get really creative depending on who your athletes are too. It's one of the things that I've, uh, I've been looking at uh, is who I want to get in what type of matchups and, and how you can do that with your own athletes, I think is an interesting way to go about it. Um, so that's, I don't see any questions in the chat. I'm going to hit refresh here just to make sure. Um, but if you have any questions on that, you know, please let me know, even if it's a few, a few minutes later, something comes to you as I start talking about the offensive stuff. Um, if you get a chance, like the video, throw a comment in there. It helps more people find it. Um, so thanks coach Scott. has got one in there for me. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, uh, and I got to switch over to offense here. The next thing I want to talk about uh, is kind of the same, like doing the same thing on offense. And I think there's kind of two groups that you really want to keep things um, simple for, uh, and that's your quarterback and your offensive line. Uh, and so we'll talk about both those things here tonight. Um, and, and I think it all depends on who, on who your, your maybe more experienced group is. Um, but I think no matter what teams I've been associated with, you know, you're always looking for ways to keep things simple for your offensive line because they have such a dynamic job um, with, with teams changing fronts and moving people around. And uh, there's so much to deal with there. Um, so that can be one, you know, one aspect you really want to keep simple. And then obviously your quarterback, you know, the hardest job in sports. 
um, and, and trying to keep things simple for them. So two things I thought would be beneficial to talk about is zone run game. Uh, and again, this really, you could do this exact, I'll, I, maybe I won't call it zone run game, tagging concepts with your run game, uh, but working off of one primary run scheme, I think is, is a huge benefit. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then just a strategy that uh, actually um, Coach Nill at the UBC um, uh, junior, I guess, Taylor Nell, uh, did a presentation on here last year about simplifying your passing game. Uh, and it's something I've seen as I've watched more CFL film, you know, over and over and over again. Um, and, and I think it's a great way to, to build simplicity uh, in your offense there as well. So starting with the zone run game um, and, and adding tags, um, I think, you know, everyone's fairly familiar, you know, at this point, I think if you're, if you're interested in this stuff and you haven't seen a clinic on zone run game yet this off season, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how you've pulled that off. It's like, there's one every couple of days. Um, you know, I think Co- coach Sharbs over at, uh, um, over at virtual football clinic has done about 10 really good ones. Um, so I won't spend too much time just talking about, you know, inside zone. Cause again, this will, this concept plays out no matter what your base run scheme is. Um, but really being able to take your base run and build tags off it. So your athletes are able to build continuity between plays. You're not dealing with a bunch of different plays. You're dealing with a, a variety of versions of one concept and that concept is able to create continuity through your offense. So just looking at a base, you know, let's say base inside zone read is your, your, your base play. Um, so you're looking at the defense going, okay, we're going to block our five most dangerous. You know, whether you double through the, the front side defensive tackle um, or have your center work with the nose, but either way we're working zone and we're going to end up reading uh the backside end if that's your base run play whatever you want to call it um we're going to read off this backside defensive end uh and maybe just have a simple throw option off of it okay so super simple super easy probably in everybody's playbook i think one way you can build simplicity is then just building tags off of this and I think the, a lot of what you see in, in U.S. college football um, and even the CFL is great wrinkles where, you know, nine of the nine of uh, the 12 players or 11 players in the field are doing the same thing that they would on their base inside zone play. Um, and they make a couple changes that that whether it's beating a tendency of the defense or, um, you know, putting their best athlete in a really good position uh, make a lot of sense. So if we're just if we're just calling this. Um, let's just, uh, let's go with, uh, if we call this, we'll go coach Scott is on here. We'll call that Ravens. Um, if this was just our inside zone uh, or our read zone was Ravens. Okay. And we're going to read this backside end. Um, if off your base Ravens play, you can then build a variety of tags. So, uh, one that's super common in the CFL, uh, would be to run some kind of slice motion. Okay, where now you're going to bring a receiver underneath the set. If the defensive end chases down and the quarterback pulls it, now they have another option. The flat could create, you know, a high-low read here. A lot of teams are really good with it, uh, running like a snag concept. To try and pick uh, for the expanding player there. All right, now completely different to defending the last play, especially in Canada. The defense has to decide, okay, are we going to rock and roll this? How are we going to handle the pick? Are we now going to switch it? So we've added one route to the previous play, and now the defense has, you know, way more communication to try and deal with here. Okay, especially if you've got a dynamic athlete at quarterback. Now you've got the threat of the run there as well. Um, this is where you get people caught in between two places. And it's a simple tag again. So we call this maybe like Raven slice. Okay. And that slice is going to tell the receiver a way that they're going to run the slice route. Okay. And the slice tells the backside players, they're going to run that, that snag concept. Okay. Really, really simple one. Another simple one would just be to have a cap player. Um, so if you've got, if you've got a defensive end, um, if you want to, you know, create variability for the defensive end, you could have your uh, your slot back come into cap. Now you're going to block the backside end, okay? And you could still read off of 
now say the edge player. So if they're in some kind of, you know, look where they're going to come down and fill it right away. Sure. You're just going to give the football, right. Trust him to cut him off. But if they, you know, if this guy goes to track and the end goes inside, you can still run the read. You don't have to. Um, but you know, you're able to now put another two players under stress. Okay. We're going to add a player uh, and, and try and cap the defensive end. Again, the O line is doing the same thing. Quarterback is making the same read. It's just on which player changes. Um, but ultimately same play. You're making the same read. This is huge when teams start changing the front, right? So I know a lot of people like the zone scheme stuff because when you change the front, it doesn't have as big an impact uh, on the on the O line up front. They're able to you know work through the tracks, work through the zone steps, and and pick that up. And with the more thirty front type stuff that we're seeing, I would say that that's a huge benefit. But you could also do this with power. So for example, this could be one gap power in the front if that's your if that's your base deal, right? If you're a one if you're a power team. Right, and you're running one back power. Just drawing it up right here. You can add all the same tags to one back power, um, whatever whatever your your stick is. Right, so you could run all those same tags with one back power. Um, the next kind of phase to that for me is okay. So we're reading the end. We can cap the end, we can slice the end, we can release. Then you can get into all the different variations where you're kind of doing both. And this is where I think in the Canadian game, it's just tough on defense because you can, you know, get presented with so much um, motion pre-snap that makes it really hard uh, to, to have any sort of educated pre-snap read. But, you know, for example, you can combine them both, right? I've seen this a ton recently where it looks like, hey, am I getting a crack? Am I getting a slice? All right, and now this player is going to seal the edge, make sure we don't get any, uh, you know, Sam pressure, right? And now this player is going to end up getting out in the release and we're going to read the end. Or from that exact same location, you know, we're going to bring the three down, bring the two down, and we're going to release the two back out. Get that to try. And now slice and cut off that backside end. And you're still running inside zone in the front, or you're still running one back power. You're still running, you know, wide zone. Could be anything, but you're adding those tags in instead of having whole new plays, right? Where now your quarterback and, and your offensive line has to, you know, change some of the basic tenets of what you do. Okay. Again, here, another way that the defense has to adjust this. So they're going to kick the, if the end shuffles, they kick them out. Who's going to be the cutback player? If the end dives inside, all right, well, now my quarterback can read it and pull and throw. Um, so that tagging process, I think, is critical. And it can just be one word. So we talked about slice, right? You might, you might, you could even add two tags. So if you add, you know, slice uh, with a cap, now you're going to cross the fullback or cross the three, right, and still cap the backside end. You could crack on the backside on the will. Um, you know, you could run uh, motion pre-snap. As long as you're keeping it simple um, for, for the offensive line in the front, there's a million different tags, you know, you can work with it. Another good one that, that's been good for us is just a lock call on the backside. So now we're going to lock the backside end. So the tackle, his job changes. Everyone else's job stays the same, right? And now we're going to get, you know, that zone read that everybody wants or that zone lock RPO that everybody wants, read the will. You know, and now we can change up the backside route combo so you could end up having double slant. Okay, so again, exact same play in the front, exact same play in the front, but you're just adding these tags to it um, that make it a lot harder for the defense to uh, to adjust properly. Um, I struggle a bit with just a question in the chat. Do you teach the motion? Do you want motion or does it make it harder for a young Q? uh with the team running no huddle that's a good that's a really good question about no huddle uh i'm i've been in a no huddle system for a while and i like it mostly for the uh the like the practice benefit um i just like being no huddle for the reps um so i haven't necessarily been crazy fast like trying to go crazy fast 
Um, you definitely want to be conscious of the motion. So you want to move with a purpose to create a certain advantage. Um, and one thing I think that I, I should be critical about myself is I tend to use motion more on run plays. Um, like I've used motion more to like create numerical advantages or create leverage. Um, but pass plays, it kind of stresses me out for that purpose. Like you bring up with the quarterback. So I would just say you want to move with a purpose. So like, for example, if you have a team, um, if you have a team that tracks motion, so they're going to, they're going to, you know, or they play a lot of man to man coverage, right. Or maybe it's even just on first down, they play a lot of man to man coverage. Maybe you want to do, you know, something as simple as, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to bring somebody back out and get to a 41 set and then run somebody back across just to get people moving. Um, and on something where you have a simple read for your quarterback. So I think like the, the thing with motion in Canada is you have so much that you can do to me, it's like moving with a purpose. So my purpose here would be, okay, I know this boundary halfback is going to have to track with uh, the original number two receiver here as they come across the set. So then they're going to have to switch with the Sam on this number three. So now, okay, now they're moving back. Now they come back to the field, right? With number three, just to run all the way back. Right. So we're doing that to make this player like if I identify, hey, this is a player that makes mistakes. We can use motion to to, you know, get them out of where they're supposed to be. Then I think there's a purpose to it. Um, but in terms of just, oh, like, let's tag a motion onto this just for fun. I would agree. Sometimes it can be stressful for the quarterback. The other thing I think with motion and, uh, you know, I think it all depends on your preference as a play caller. Um, but you have to be ready for the defense to not do what they're supposed to do. And I think that that building that into like your reads and your pass progression, and that's a topic for another day, but how you actually teach quarterbacks to process information on whether guys are open or not, that's where you get in trouble with you. If you just like read the coverage and say, okay, they're in this coverage. So this should be how it plays out. You know, for example, you might have a, a flat player that because of the motion, you know, makes a mistake, carries a vertical, or you might have, a vertical player that because of the motion, you know, doesn't play the vertical responsibility that they should. So it's, it's a valuable question. Um, I would just say you need to motion with a purpose. And if you're motioning with a purpose, then I would say, you know, you're, you, then you can weigh out the cost, the, the cost benefit analysis of it. Um, and uh, you know, ultimately if, you know, you feel like, Hey, I can live with, with this, or we're going to do it in these situations. Um, you know, but it's a good thing to be cognizant enough for sure. It's a great point. Um, so that would, that's kind of, you know, my stick on tagging, uh, the run game, you can tag it with, you know, backside RPOs and lock the backside end. You can tag it with the zone read stuff. You can tag it by adding different blockers. And the other thing you can simply do is just change formation. To me, changing formation is like the, you know, the offensive version of changing the front. So for example, if you're a spread team, and this is something, you know, I've done, we've done in the past um, to get offensive linemen on the field. If you're a five R team, that's great. Um, but if you've got a couple of young offensive linemen that you're trying to get on the field a little bit, okay, well now maybe you're going to play some double tight end, right. And you're still running inside zone. You're still reading the backside uh, edge player, but now it's just one player out from where it was the end before. Right. So you're still running inside zone. You can cap that backside end and read the halfback. Oh, good. Another good question. So with your one, two word play calls, is the motion auto or would you call the motion? Um, good question. For the most part, being honest myself, I haven't used as, as much motion as an offensive play caller myself. So I can only speak to what I've seen other people do. I've seen people do both. Um, I would say you want to be careful with how much information goes into one play call. Like if it's, if it's something you want to use that week and it's just for the week, you might be able to one word it and say, Hey, like one of the things I'm going to ask you to memorize this week is this. Um, but also I would say, you know, again, if you're able to like, if you're able to 
um, send in your tags with your run play. So for example, if we were going to run a motion, um, you know, we would, we would usually call the formation first. So we're going to get lined up first uh, or signboard the formation in. Um, and then from there, you know, we're going to make our actual play call. So if we were going to line up in, in 32, we would get lined up in 32. And then if we wanted to go 32 to 23, we would call that motion in with the zone slice, but it does build in the no huddle a little bit more, um, you know, that, that you need to be able to do, to, to communicate in, but that, that would be my preference would be to stay no huddle um, and then to call the motion in. Uh, and usually I've seen people call in the motion with the formation. So for example, you call in, um, you know, however you call in your formations, whether it's like signboard or hand signal or combination, you'd call in, you know, if, if 32, you called Ranger, you would call in like Ranger. And if disco was your motion to go from Ranger to 23, um, you know, you would call that in, in the formation um, is, is probably the best way to go. But that's a great question. And it is a valid concern. It's one of the reasons why I haven't done necessarily as much motion, um, but I have done a fair amount of moving across the formation, like late, like to slice stuff, um, which I think is, is good to build in build in um so here you know if you want to come out one week and again i think a lot of people think oh if we run a formation we have to run all of our stuff out of it i don't necessarily agree with that um obviously over a course of a season you want to be aware of what your tendencies are formationally that obviously um but being able to come out and change the picture for the defense um maybe it's because of injuries that you have or maybe it's a player that's developing you know that's playing better than this than you know has played for you in the past you want to get them on the field um, or even just a weakness of the opponent that you want to try and attack. Um, again, keeping it the exact same inside zone is the easiest example. Um, and now being able to tag, okay, we're going to, we're going to run Ravens here. Um, and we're going to read the backside end. So that means that the tight end here has to arc release, right? So again, you could tag the arc in there for them if you want, or you can just leave it as Ravens, right? Without the tag. Um, and, and that keeps it, you know, very, very consistent. Same thing. You could get into your slice game, you know, again, this is simple. It's just out of a new formation, but exact same thing. Um, you know, you can, you can get into a lot of different variations, um, that I think inside zone is the simplest version to get into, um, but being able to tag it instead of having different plays. And I think that's become really commonplace, especially with no huddle. Um, but being able to tag plays, so you're not going to call, you know, this Ravens and then another form of inside zone zipper, you're going to keep, you know, if, if, if zone read is Ravens, you know, you're going to keep that and then you're just going to add tags to it. It lets you bring a lot, uh, a lot to the table um, in terms of different concepts. The last thing I wanted to talk about uh, is kind of a similar idea in the past game. And this is something that um, I have really learned in the last couple of years. Um, like I said, uh, coach Taylor Neal from, uh, UBC came on and did a good presentation about it um, and uh, working with, with coach Galloway at Laurier, but he, he's uh, put in, you know, uh, he's used this in the past and, and some, another person had spent some time you know, helping me learn this. And I think this is probably something that I um, was a, was a bit of a gap in my knowledge, honestly, was like understanding how to use mesh. I was not a big, um, you know, mesh play caller probably up until the last couple of years. And it's still not, you know, maybe as big a part of my offense, as, as some others, but, um, you know, whether it's Coach Neal or Coach Galloway, just really smart guys that, that I have a lot of respect for. Breaking this down, I, I see why it's such a big part of uh, so many CFL teams um, that run it. So we're just, I'm just going to get this diagram back here to uh, 32. Like I said, feel free to, to ask a question, fire a question in the chat. Um, it's a huge help to us. Uh, if there's a, if there's more things in the chat, more likely people will see it. Uh, like we said, we're so close to a thousand, so it's it's huge for us. Anything you can share on social media um, to help us get there is great. We're really getting close. We've been working for over a year now, um, and uh, it'll be really rewarding to get you know get to a thousand and get the views that we need um, to uh, to take the channel to the next level and and you know monetize a little bit. Hopefully, I can get a little better camera set up or whatever we choose to do at that point. But um, so this would be to me a great way if you wanted to like start a passing game. So if you're looking at, okay, what are, what are my, you know, main go-to concepts going to be in an offense? 
Um, and, and this would be a great place to start, I think, because you can create so many variations and keep the read consistent for the quarterback, um, which again, the last kind of segment, how can we keep it simple for the O-line? Um, and this would be, you know, how, how can we keep this simple for the quarterback? Um, so I'm going to get this set up here. All right. So I'm just going to call it. So this would be some kind of mesh variation. Okay. Um, and so lots of different teams have different ways of calling the protection. Um, but I'm just going to set the protection here to the boundary. So the slide side is going to go to the field more so just about the location of the back. Okay, and there's kind of three parts to this like progression read. So there's going to be your, uh, your base one-on-one -on -one route. And another reason why I like this is, is you get a chance to get the ball to your best player uh, frequently. Okay, and then you're going to build, uh, you know, back down to the mesh. So take a look on the back side here. We're going to run a 10 yard out. If you want, you can put in the post option. And if we get one-on-one -on -one cover zero, that's where that's one place we can go with the football. Um, you know, if we get man, we like to match up. That's one place we can go with the football. Okay, but that's kind of like our our, our alert on the backside. And there's different ways of doing this, um, but that that's just what I'm gonna draw up for now. Okay, and then we're gonna have our mesh. So again, lots of people have different ways they like to teach mesh. I'm going to do it with our three receiver going over the top, running back and run the swing out of the check release. Okay. So there's three parts. There's your basic route on the backside where you're able to, you know, throw the out, throw the post based on leverage of the corner. So if the corner's in outside leverage, you can run the post. Uh, if the corner's, you know, um, high and inside, you can run the out. Then we have our mesh part of the concept. And then we're going to get to the variable part of where we can mix things up. So I'm going to draw it from the start just with your basic, uh, your basic dig concept. Okay. That's an ugly dig rope. So again, if we get one-on-one, -on -one, we can always take it on the backside. Okay. But we should be able to take two players with this backside route, because they're gonna need somebody high inside of it and low outside of it to take away both options, okay? Then from there, all right, we're gonna read a concept back down to the mesh. So if we're here, we can take a look. Again, we might be able to pre-snap, say, hey, if they're in, you know, like a cut contour in the boundary, this route's probably not gonna be a viable option for us, okay? So if we can recognize that pre-snap, we can start on our concept and read that top down, back down to our mesh. If we get pressure, we can come to our mesh right away. So we know we're gonna take two with the backside route, okay? Now we're looking, can we make you know this vertical or this mid-level throw? And we're gonna read this top down if we have time, bottom up if we get pressure. So if we get the vertical route capped in the combo, here of these of these two routes. So here we have a seam and the dig. If we get the seam route cap, say by the corner and the safety, okay. Now we're gonna high low and work uh, work from our dig route back down to our mesh route. Okay, so we're gonna go from our one on one on the back side to our concept back down to the mesh. And then you can build a ton of stuff off of this. So, you know, you can run your gin concept. You can run, uh, you could run like a four verts concept with the bender read off of it. You could run, uh, you could run a, what I've seen called a mills concept or quarters beater where you get the dig and the post. Okay, you can run any sort of uh, two man high low there, uh, but ultimately you're looking to go one on one, 
to the concept back down to the mesh. Okay. So if we're able to, if we have time, we're going to read the concept top down. If we don't have time, say this is pressure or our, you know, our three tech loses on the spike inside. We don't have time to wait for this post dig to develop. We can come to the mesh right now. Um, and what I like about that is you have a variety of options um, that you can tag on the front side of it uh, and keep this backside read process the same. Um, and then you can get into tag and mesh. You know, you can have release the back. You could get into, you know, like a three man mesh variation um, where you're bringing both. You could bring two down, hook up over the ball. Okay, and still run your vertical shot there and read it out the same way. You have a ton of options, um, but again, you're able to, to keep a huge part of that consistent for your quarterback. Uh, read the one-on-one -on -one through the concept, back down to the mesh. Read the one-on-one -on -one through the concept, back down to the mesh. And again, if you get hurried up by pressure, you have your one-on-one -on -one option, or you also have your, you know, the mesh, especially against man is great. Um, and if you get zoned, you're able to work that kind of three level high low to the field. You can do the same thing. I mean, I know it's tough um, depending on your, your quarterback's arm strength. You can do the same thing with like the fade out concept to the field. Okay. Uh, and again, unless you're going to throw this one-on-one, -on -one, you could even start here, right? Work down through the concept to the mesh um, is a good way to go. Uh, but you give yourself a lot of continuity between the concepts uh, and it's, it's challenging, you know, defensively to defend. And again, you can get into you know, a variety of, of formations and run the same thing. Um, the other thing that uh, as I watched some of the CFL stuff I was watching yesterday, I think uh, high school coaches especially could benefit from is if you're not a five R team, so you don't have five wide receivers that you, know, you feel really confident in, or maybe, two of your best players are running backs or, you know, maybe you have a fullback or, you know, a hybrid offensive lineman that you're playing as a fullback or uh, a linebacker that's going both ways is being able to run two, but you want to spread the defense out um, is using that. Uh, we'll call it the F player. Using that second back and just moving them around in the formation. So for example, I think a lot of people keep their fullback type at the three to the field, which is great as long as you want to, you know, use him as a blocker to the field. Um, you know, you can do some really simple things with motion, uh, you know, and, and switch these two inside receivers um, if you want. Uh, and Mac used to do this a ton when they had Declan Cross uh, out there. Is you can put your fullback at the number one spot and get into different personnel sets where, you know, if this field corner, if they're always just playing, you know, hold to the field and you want to keep this route simple, you know, you could have, like, say you're running your smash concept on the inside and you want, you know, your two of your better route runners in that smash concept, you don't want your fullback to be there. Just moving them around in the formation um, is I think a really simple way. Again, you can create a variety of looks, uh, but keep things the same. And one of the most underrated uses of it, I think, especially um, against teams. And this is something that, you know, I've seen a little bit coaching in summer football is if you put them at the two week, I know that's a key route running spot, but often, you know, base quarters teams are playing the half high. And so, you know, you have no immediate, the half has to be a run fitter. If, you know, you get this fullback involved in the box right now that half has to fit off of it and that might get them either out of their quarters look or the half has to come off the roof to play the fit the, the to play their run responsibility that can be a real challenge so just another way to add kind of a variety if you're a two-back team but want to run some spread stuff um is just having your fullback play in the slot and then move them around um you know again when you talk about motion can be a good way to uh to create whether it's a matchup advantage or a numbers advantage um, by moving the fullback but that's a couple of things there that, that I find really effective. So, you know, kind of going back to making sure we cover our bases here defensively. I think if you're going to bring blitzes, you want to keep your number of blitzes down, but just change the number of fronts. Um, so you could honestly live with two or three different blitz calls or blitz paths, and then just change the front up, you know, weekly um, and get guys in different spots. Um, 
and, and keep the coverages the same on the back end. I think that's critical. And then offensively, you know, I think there's always something to be said for keeping things simple for the O-line and keeping things simple for the quarterback. They have two of the harder jobs, you know, cerebrally in the offense. Uh, and so being able to use tags with your base run plays instead of naming things a bunch of different plays, having tags off your base calls, um, and then building some some repeatability in your pass game. So regardless of, again, that's that concept I was showing there with mesh, that's your mesh concept with, say, three or four tags. It's not, you know, okay, we're going to call it this, we're going to call it that, over, under, um, and you, you start having a bunch of different names for people to memorize. You're building those concepts together with tags. So um, if there's no more questions there, I'll, I'll call it up that. If anyone has any questions or anything they want me to talk about, throw in the chat. Um, you know, once again, we had some tech issues. But uh, we got going. Um, always a new problem with that each week, but we've gotten on here every time. So um, it's not always right right at 8.15 or 8 o'clock, but we got on there. So I appreciate everyone who's, who's watching who stuck it out today. Um, and if there's no more questions, I'll call it. But uh, thanks again for coming on Tuesdays. We're going to keep doing these on Tuesdays, and you know, hopefully we're all coaching again soon.